Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Brother Chuck Kay. I really enjoyed visiting with him. Um, he is the father of Rachel Krauss, who does our awesome uh, memes, I guess you might call them, our little graphics for for social, social media. Brother K is just delightful, and we talk about him preferring to be called Brother K rather than by his first name, and I, I love that too about him. I just had a great time visiting with him. I'm so grateful that he wanted to be a guest and that he and I could make that happen. I hope you enjoy this conversation because I certainly did. I'm on the phone today with Brother Chuck K. Um, Brother K, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Uh, yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Phoenix, Arizona, so I didn't get a immersion in the Hopi language. I, I knew when my parents were uh, upset with me or happy with me, by, even though they were speaking Hopi, but uh, for the uh, general dialogue, I didn't uh, ever learn the language. So I am Charles K. Um, that uh, I'm uh, a member of the uh, Coyote Clan and uh, that uh, I've uh, actually gone through some of the ceremonies of growing up on Hopi uh, in my lifetime. So I, I do feel very connected to uh, the Hopi people and, and the folks on the family on the reservation. And uh, anyway, my, uh, my parents grew up there on the reservation, Jasper K and my mother Etta Tanakyama K. So, uh, and a member of the church. That's who I am. Awesome. Um, Brother K, would you please share something that you love about your heritage as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ? It can be pretty much anything a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony. What do you love about your heritage? You know, um, I think for me, it is uh, basically how close Hopi way of life and, and traditions, that they're, even their ceremonies, are connected to the gospel. They, they do things that are very similar. I mean, they, they marry, they have basically eternal marriage, and it's, uh, they um, talk about and try to live uh, in a, uh, oh, a very close family way. They, uh, Hopi is, are basically means uh, peaceful people or the people of peace. And so they, they try to live that in, in all aspects of what they do, whether it's, you know, herding sheep or growing corn or fixing food or whatever they do, they try to do that with, uh, with a good heart and a good mind, a good mindset to do that in order to uh, do what they do every day. And uh, to me, that is living a Christ-like life that they don't think about themselves or try not to be too upset by things so that when they do things for others, especially, they do it with the right mindset. I love that. Um, yeah, we've we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, we try, like, ideally to live that kind of life, don't we? Yeah, and, and I think when we do things, whether it's uh, serve in a calling or clean up after an event or whatever it is that we are, are sometimes asked to do or sometimes just jump in and volunteer, I think we need that right mindset. We need to have uh, the end in mind when we do these things. It's not just the task itself. It's how this helps and, and we should do it with the, the, the best way that we can. We should put our best efforts into it. Yeah, love that. Um, 
So, Brother Kay, were you raised as a member of the Church of Jesus Christ? No, um, that's kind of a, a story, too. But um, I, uh, my dad actually was the first one in our family that was introduced to the church, but he, he uh, had a problem with alcohol, and so he ended up in jail for a year. And, and honestly, I don't think we would be members of the church if that hadn't happened to my dad. I cannot imagine my father sitting down with a couple of missionaries and having them teach him the gospel. It just doesn't work in my mind. But he was in jail and he had a couple of people that he worked with and they were members of the church and they reached out to him and read the Book of Mormon to him and, and taught him lessons and, and did all that stuff while he was in jail. So that when he came out, uh, not only was he sober, but he had the gospel. And so he was the first one to be baptized in our family. And uh, it was eye-opening to me that he made a change like that, because from what he was before to what he became and that what he eventually, how he ended up his life was very inspiring to me, because I know those addictions are hard to kick, and uh, he, he went through all that. But since I was, a, you know, uh, he was a member, we had other, you know, missionaries visit us and teach us the lessons. And the ward I was in, I had, uh, I guess, uh, one of the sisters there, perhaps she was the Relief Society president at the time, her, her son befriended me. And so I'm sorry if I get a little emotional on this part, but um, his family uh, brought me along in the gospel. And um, I'm going to say his name because I want people to know who he is just for my sake. Uh, Willard Sidney Krause goes by Skip, and uh, he um, brought me along to all the activities. He didn't ever forget to call me and say, oh, we're meeting with the scouts tonight, or we're going to have a, a camp out, or we're going to go to the temple, or he always called me, and his mom was always willing to pick me up. And through that, I, I'll have to say that all the gospel blessings that I enjoy today are because of his efforts. There is nothing anybody could say or a video. I could see him, you know, beating up a group of kids or something. I would never, ever think badly of him because of what he did for my family. I'm married in the temple and all my children were born under the covenant and all of their children are born under the covenant. And for me, that's what he brought me. He brought me an eternal family. And just through simple efforts, just friendshiping, just asking me if I'd had a ride to something. Uh, that's how I'm a member of this church. And that's how I have all the blessings of this gospel is through the efforts of this person. So I love him very dearly. And uh, we've been friends ever since we were probably 12 years old. So we're still good friends this day. And so that's that's how I joined the church, was through all of his efforts. I I love what you just said, that it was, it sounds like he wasn't like, oh, got to call Kay again. I got to, I got to do this. It was like, hey, I want you there. Right. Yeah, basically, he loved me into the church. He, he, we were friends. And, you know, it's funny because even his mom said one time, he says, you know, when, when I was pregnant uh, with Skip, she says, you know, I actually thought I was going to have twins. So I thought there was another person connected to him. And, uh, you know, it didn't happen that way. But she says, you know, seeing you guys together, I think that that's what I felt. I felt you two were connected somehow. And uh, that's that was her impression of, of how close we were. Wow, I love that. <laughs> I think, man, if we could all find people to be connected to like that, that would <laughs> that would raise us all up. Well, you know, and, and I, I speak about this sometimes when I bear my testimony or, or if I give a talk, and that you know there are people within our sphere of influence, maybe in there in our ward. And um, 
they're, they're, they might not be close to the church or maybe even stepped away from it. Uh, and there are people somewhere praying for that person, praying that somebody will reach out to them. And, and you know, I know if it was my child and they were estranged from the church, I'd be praying every day there would be somebody who would be able to reach out and find them and uh, friendship them and, and offer them the blessings of the gospel again. So it's, it's, it's there available for us to do, I think, every day. Wow, love that. Um, you were mentioning to me earlier that you also had a unique friendship group, not just this not not just this one friend, but you had a unique friendship group as you were growing up. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, during our high school years, a, a group of us that all went to the same ward, um, we had a, a seminary. They had this old house that they converted into a seminary building across from the high school. And so we would attend there. And um, I guess, I don't know if we were a uniquely close group, but I know that we were a close group, and so all the things we did, we did together, whether we played church sports or went to an activity, and, and so people would see us in the morning coming all together as a group from across the street coming to school. We had early morning seminary back then, and so we had people ask us, you know, what are you guys doing, and, and all those things. Such, there's so many natural missionary opportunities sometimes we don't really take advantage of. But, but we, you know, we invite them to come and play softball or basketball or to come on a camp out or just do those regular friendshiping things because they were our friends. And so it seemed very natural to do that. Well, out of that, um, there were uh, 10 people that I know of that ended up being baptized that became members of the church because of the efforts of this group. And there were probably about maybe 12 or 15 of us that you know i think we're connected to these people but um so we we found friends some of them actually found uh, spouses <laughs> from these connections and including myself and that's kind of a interesting little story because um during high school uh, a friend uh ruth my wife was a friend in the group and so uh I was uh, became priest to age, and so she her family did not want her to have anything to do with the church. But we finally, in our ward, actually had a uh, fasted and prayed for her and her sister to be able to take the discussions. And I, to my surprise, I guess it shouldn't have been a surprise, but to my surprise, her dad allowed her to go ahead and take the missionary lessons. And so. Um, being a priest, the elders invited me and, and a couple other friends of mine, you know, on a rotating basis to come to the house with them and teach them the lessons. So I actually got to teach my wife the lessons. And so, um, but we still weren't connected, you know, we weren't boyfriend, girlfriend, but just good friends. And I went on my mission and she did, you know, she worked and did whatever was going on here uh, at home. And then after my mission, we kind of connected up again. And so we realized that we were probably around each other for all this time for, for a reason. And, uh, you know, we uh, started dating and, and uh, were married. So uh, not only did we make some good friends and be able to bring the gospel to some people, some of us found eternal companions out of that group. I love that that story it's so perfect it's so great and i love too what you said that now it those blessings from the people that helped your dad in in jail and the your friends just growing up now you have the blessings of the covenants of the the temple i love that yeah so um you said you are an urban indian uh, but you also have mentioned to me that you spent quite a bit of time back on Hopi. Do you want to tell some of the experiences about that? Sure. That, you know, uh, that's probably a, a good highlight of my life. I really enjoyed doing that. Although every time we went out there, it was hard work, you know, 
the, the back then in the village where my mom was from, uh, Hope Villa, which is on First Mesa on the Hopi Reservation. Uh, my, my mom's from Hope Villa. My dad is from the lower village at Munkapi near Tuba City. And but we go usually to my aunt's house. And the first thing you did as soon as you got out of the back of the truck, you go in the house and my aunt would hand each of us two buckets two of those old metal galvanized buckets, you know, and we'd have to walk down off the Mesa to the spring and fill up two buckets and climb back up the Mesa with these two buckets of water. So it wasn't like, oh, great, we're here. We can, you know, kick off our shoes and, and you know, play around with our cousins. It was OK, get right to work. And, and that's kind of how it was there. I mean, we had plenty of time to play and and, you know, you had some experiences, I guess, that a lot of kids don't have. The Hopi, Hopi houses are flat roofs. And so when you get a lot of people there, uh, there was not enough room in the house to sleep, so you slept up on the roof. Uh, so that was kind of unique things, you know, stuff that you thought was kind of fun because you don't ever get to do that. But there were always days when, you know, it was time to plant corn or go out and, and do weeding or or uh, if it got real windy or flooded, you have to set the corn back up, the corn stalks back up and make sure they're not bent or crumpled or anything. And then uh, harvest time, you had to go out and do that. Uh, we would go and harvest pinon nuts, uh, climb up on the mesas with lard on our hands, trying to pick those <laughs> pine cones that were all sticky with sap and and then roast them. And uh, But there was always, you know, wood to chop or water to haul or something. So it was it was good uh, experience for me and um, learning how uh, my ancestors lived in, in real in real time. You know, actually being able to do some of these things, and uh, so those were good times for me. Those were times that I learned to respect the people, um, got included in some of the ceremonies and and things that are part of a young man growing up uh, on Hopi, and. Uh, but mostly respected the hard work and, and desire to live that life that they have. You know, Hopi is is an old <laughs> tribe. They they uh, old uh, arrivee there on um, the second mesa. They uh, you know have been uh, or it's designated as the uh, oldest continuously inhabited uh, village in uh, America. So they've been there a long time, at least, you know, 1500 more, more years than that, probably. But um, that's what they can date with uh, with technology. So anyway, and there are buildings still there that are still used from that long ago. So to to understand that I'm part of a society that uh, has lived there that long when when, you know, all the other natives were being pushed into reservations that they just drew a line around us because we've always lived there and didn't want to go anywhere else anyway. So that's where we were. So, um, but that to me taught me a lot. I, I learned the respect that the people have for the earth and for all creatures there, all, all things are part of this plan and, and they have a, a function and, um, they are not just to be destroyed, even if they're past, they're to be removed if you can, but, you know, sometimes you just got to get rid of them. But it's, it, it was a, a respect for the earth, for the, the sun, for the rain, for many of the things that are, are natural. And, and for me, uh, sometimes, you know, sitting on our elders quorum and, and I hear comments about things that, um, the people who've not don't know these experiences have no understanding of how this is all connected. You know, it's not just um, a spiritual gospel principle. It's part of a plan and part of all the things that Heavenly Father created, and it's it's all connected together. And uh, to me, that eye-opening experience has really helped me in my uh, faith and in my understanding of the gospel. Yeah. Um, well, isn't it Joseph Smith who said something like, if we truly understood it, we wouldn't even kill 
spiders or something like that? Right. They they're all they all have a function. They're all there to do something. And uh, and sometimes it is to to give up their life. You know, when when I know when a lot of natives. I I, I served a mission. I served up in in Montana and uh, Wyoming and uh, met a lot of tribes, you know, all, all kinds of people. And uh, the uh, they all have that reverence about uh, life. And if you take a life, it's, it's not just a, a task or a process. It's, it's something that's spiritual. And, and they honor that and they respect the animal and give thanks to the animals to for giving their life for being here. That is that was their purpose for being here was to feed us and clothe us and provide us uh, with the things that we need. Yeah, love that. So so yeah, you mentioned that you did serve a mission. Um, were there any people in particular that you remember from your mission, like um, that? have continued to be a part of your life or just like made such an impact on your life that you think about them from time to time and uh, remember that? Yeah, I unfortunately didn't stay close to a lot of my companions. And I'll have to tell you a little story about a missionary in my my mission that I connected with years later. But um, I served the probably most of the first half of my mission on reservations and so um just getting to know the people there and the faith of people and and trying to learn you know people talk about going to foreign countries and having to learn languages and having to learn uh customs and stuff it's the same when you go to different tribes they they have different things that you can do you know that you 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 know women can do or, or not supposed to do or men can do this, but you know it, it's it's uh, you, you have to be careful. Sometimes you don't step on little landmines when you when you do things or address people or ask them to do things. I remember uh, there was a sister. She was uh, telling us that she needed some help with her car, and she was talking about walking down the road. And her I think it was her father in law came by, and um, you know so he asked her, oh, he did, was not able to help you. She says, well. In our custom, we don't we don't talk to them. We we she says I can't even look at him. I'm not should I should not be looking at him. So she said I had to turn away and put my hand in front of my face <laughs> the whole time I was talking to him. And so it it, it kind of shocked me. Well, there was somebody right here could have helped you, but we uh, and we had a lot of rules about you know using our mission truck to do certain things, and so. We couldn't tow people out of places, stuff like that. So unfortunately, we couldn't help, but we got our help. But it, it was just funny. There were certain little little traditions and, and uh, ways of their society that uh, it, it didn't make sense to me, but it, there somewhere down the line was a purpose, I guess. And so so learning those things and, and learning the, the customs and history and uh, beliefs of a lot of these folks, you know, there was... Uh, I mean, I was among the Blackfoot and the Cinnaboyne, Crow, Chippewa, Cree, Grovan, uh, Sioux, Northern Cheyenne. So I met a lot of these folks, you know, talked to them. They were pretty willing to talk to me. A lot of times I think the elders, the white elders, uh, they weren't as willing to talk. But seeing this little brown guy come up and talk to them, they, I think they uh, accepted that a lot easier. And uh, so learning all that and and uh, being able to incorporate the things, I, I realized that there's so many of the stories that match up, especially the story about a great white leader, person, spirit, whatever it was, came to them, taught them their ways of life, gave them rules and said, this is the way you should live and left with a promise to come back again. And so that was kind of universal. Um, whatever they call them, hope you have something that's similar to that. And so that that really bolstered my faith, realizing that, that all of those things. And unfortunately, there were some, some I didn't have but maybe three baptisms the whole time I was out of my mission. But I, I heard that several others were baptized later. But the thing that, that uh, impressed me about being able to do that is that I realized why 
I was there. I mean, it wasn't even actually even until I went on my mission that I actually completely read with focus the Book of Mormon. And in doing that, I realized that that um, well, you know, like like I mentioned to you about the, the, I like being called Brother K because it reminds me that I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It's a it's a regular thing to me. Um, that reminds me of that, and I learned on my mission, or at least this is my my thought, that they we're called elders who are serving out there, and that there are only two groups of brethren in the church that we address as elder, and that's the general authorities, and the other are the male priesthood holders serving full time missions, and and I realize it's because we have the same job. We do the same thing. We testify of Christ, and we we bless people's lives, and we help, and and that is the the role of the apostles and the general authorities, is to build the kingdom with that focus only, with nothing else in the way, that we and and I would say that to my companions. You know, sometimes they say, "Hey, K," or "Hey, Chuck," or you know, whatever. And I'd say, "Hey, I'm Elder K," and and I remember even the mission president. Uh, mission president's wife would call him president, and the president would call his wife sister, and and it made a difference to me. It's, it's like in in ancient Israel, you know, the, the family, the name, the titles were all all important. Even the names were part of the personality or responsibility of the person who had that name, and. Um, that there's there's some importance and power in that, and um, I try to respect that as much as I can. You know, I'll, I'll even tell that to new missionaries that come into our ward. I'll tell them, I said, don't call each other by your last name. Don't call your your companion hey or whatever. I said, you call them elder. It's because that's what you were set apart as, and that's who you are until you get home and become a regular regular member of your ward again because you have a special responsibility. I that's so cool. I love how you brought that back to the title. Um that just made me think of I can't even remember which apostle talked about how um I can't even remember which apostle. Um there was a talk not too long ago about how um the church is led by elderly people and it's because they have more wisdom and they um, have been able to see the patterns in the, the lives that we're living and the patterns in the scripture. They've had more time. But I also love that you said the young men serving missions are elders and they are able to the missionaries are able to devote that time to looking through the scriptures and looking at peoples and being able to testify. That just gives me a little bit more meaning to to the plan as well, to the organization of the church. I love that. Yeah, I, I think that that's important that we that we incorporate. And, and again, this is to me, this is all part of being Hopi that that we connect these things that we make them all part of our life and and it's we don't separate these things out they're just an everyday part of our uh, life here on our on earth and our experience here um i also love that you like to be called brother k um once upon a time i was a relief society teacher in a in a pretty small ward and I spent one one part of one lesson asking people what they wanted to be called. And there were people, there were sisters who said, I would like to be called sister and then their last name. They're like, it makes me feel like we're family. Right. So yeah. I love that. I like that too. Yeah. So um, after your mission, um, how long... Did it take until you and your wife were married? Uh, I think it was probably a year or less 
I mean, it's it's it could have been two months, but you know, I, I just needed to work and stuff. We'd known each other for so long. Actually, I first met my wife. She doesn't even remember this, but I first encountered my wife when we were in junior high. I remember her there. We had some kind of little uh, conversation in the hallway between classes, and uh, she went on her way. But I, her image stuck in my mind. And so I, I didn't put it together till after uh, she had been baptized and I realized, oh, that was that was that uh, redheaded girl. My, my wife is Anglo, so she's she's a green eyed, red haired, freckle faced girl. So uh, <laughs> she uh, um, is uh, a wonderful, wonderful help. She keeps me on the straight and narrow and reminds me of the things that I need to do every day, and and um, it's uh, it's a huge blessing to have her in my life and to have her as a mother of my children. She she dotes over them and she watches them and is uh, involved with every part of their life and and thinks about them twenty four seven. So I couldn't have a better companion than her. And. Um, have you taken her back to Hopi to meet family and friends? Oh, yeah, that's that's always an interesting story because when we were dating, you know, being native, we, we hunted and fished and stuff. And uh, I remember there were times when uh, she'd come over to dinner and my mom would be cooking something and, you know, it'd be a stew or something or even some kind of uh, barbecued meat or something. And she'd put it on the table and Ruth would lean over to me. She said, what kind of meat is this? <laughs> so she, yeah, I mean, we could have any, anything from quail or dove or rabbit or <laughs> any kind of thing for dinner. And uh, so she was a little leery of that. But yeah, we've, she's gone out there and, and uh, Hopi have a unique tradition about marriage. And uh, it's it's a long process. I mean, it could be months and, and even years, depending on, on resources and stuff for, for a wedding to take place. It, it has a lot to do with with the corn and, and other things, other uh, um, Hopi traditional foods and stuff that, that are available. But anyway, uh, part of this process is the families gather, and I still don't really understand all this. All I know is <laughs> is they will come. By, I had a relative fairly recently get uh, married, and uh, the two families actually have a big mud fight. And they're, it's, it's, they're calling each other names or, or talking about all the shortcomings of either the bride or the groom, you know, though she won't be able to cook. She doesn't know how to do this. She can't take care of a house, you know, where's she going to learn that from, you know? And so it's, it's kind of hilarious. It's actually kind of, kind of a good way for everybody to get everything off their chest before they get married and get this all done and over with and that everybody's hugging and laughing and eating together and washing their hair out with all the mud in it. And, and so it's a, uh, it's a really unique kind of thing. And so unfortunately, she didn't have to go through that. But certainly all the uh, the insulting part was still available to them. So, you know, she got some of that when we go out to the reservation right after we got married. So. Wow. I didn't know any of that happened in, oh. in Hopi. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's it's a crazy weddings are, are huge. And, you know, and, and they believe that, you know, you will have that same companion in the hereafter. So. Uh, all the stuff is, is very symbolic to them about the things that, that uh, they want to have happen. They want to get all the, the evil and animus out of the way before they get started. You know? it, it, even, Hopi has some unique things also. One of the things is a lot of times parents don't discipline their children, not, you know, corporately anyway. And uh, that's left to an uncle. You always had an uncle who was the mean uncle. And so if you got in trouble, your mom would say, I'm going to tell your uncle and he's going to come and he's going to whip you, you know. And so we'd get all scared and we'd straight up, you know, because that was a real thing. And hope they would <laughs> come over. And so I thought that was great because the, you didn't get your parents. You, you didn't put a wall between your parents and you. It was the uncle who meted out all that punishment if you needed it. And I kept the, the relationship between the parents close, uh, but not without discipline. So I, I thought that was a great way of doing that. Wow. That's that's interesting, too. 
Huh. I wonder if that has... I totally have no idea, but I just wonder if that has anything to do with Jesus and Satan. Yeah, you know, he took that. There, There is a part, and and um, seems like these days people are willing to share all the, the details of Hopi um, religious ceremonies and stuff. And, and I, I try not to, but there are things that they do in these ceremonies that are very close to the gospel and the Savior stepping in for us and taking the punishment for us so that we don't have to do that. And so there's uh, there's some very close, uh, from my point of view, I know that you know probably the average Hopi doesn't see anything like that, but from being in the gospel, being a member of the church and, and, and understanding the role that that is what this is all about and uh they understand that they have a you know when you when you look at the the chronology for hopi and and the most general ideas of when hopi started were basically about the time that um after the savior left you know that 400 years it's about that timetable three four hundred years is when the emergence of hopi at least uh, um, scientifically um, emerged, and uh, that to me tells me that I think that they they were um, at least familiar with um, the Savior and what he taught. Yeah. So, what do you do with your life now? Like, uh, what's your career, and um, do you have any? things that you do on the side? Yeah. Um, so I, uh, I spent 30 plus years in, in the corporate world doing sales. I, I was in truck transportation and worked for large companies and did, uh, toward the end of that career, I, I did truck equipment sales, meaning things that are like you put on these big utility trucks, you put dump truck bodies and cranes and lift gates and all those kinds of things. So was involved with that, and um, I, I I was kind of fortunate to be able to do that because I didn't have an education. I didn't go to college. I, I think I went to a semester of college, and and honestly, uh, I don't know if I should throw this in here, but I, I didn't have a large uh, uh, respect for school. I um, I I just wanted to get through with school so I could go to work, and so so here was one of my little schemes. Um, I, I did not like English. I, I did not like sentence structure and all that. I, I've done well. I, I haven't, you know, I, I have a good vocabulary, I think, but I, I didn't like to do all those other things. And so my freshman year in high school, I took freshman English. My freshman summer, I took sophomore English. And my junior, or my, my uh, sophomore year in school, I took junior English. And then my uh, sophomore summer, I took senior English, so I was all done with it. So for for the rest of the, the two years of school, I didn't have to take any English classes. And so I realized then that there's just a lot of things that are just check marks. You know, you, you have to recite this or remember that or do this. And I hope this doesn't destroy anybody's I you know desire for education. But for this is what it was for me. Uh, so for example, in science in high school. I was very good in science. I, I loved science, and so I wouldn't do any homework, and I would just ace the tests on Friday and, you know, got to be in science for, for all my efforts without really doing anything. And so I, I did that, and I kind of did the same thing in college. Um, I had an uh, American history professor that uh, would talk about uh, you know the Revolutionary War and stuff, but he he uh, elaborated on it with with more kind of flowery language. You know this this came to a boil and this boiled over into this and caused you know, and so I listened to the words that he said, and then when we had tests or reports to do, I would use his language <laughs> in in my reports to give it back, and he gave me great grades on that. I thought you know what this is really I, I'm doing this, but it's not really 
improving me any. I, I learned some dates and times and stuff, but I don't think I'm, anybody's ever going to ask me that. I'm not going to have to do anything with this information later on. And so, so I left that and just tried to go to work after that point. But uh, I found out that probably if you're not going to educate yourself, you need to be a salesman. <laughs> you can do very well being a salesperson and not having a degree. And they ask for that more and more these days, but I think they just want to test your your uh, desire to fulfill responsibility and, and do some things. But um, I, I just had, I think, a good personality and was able to get along with people and, and read people fairly well. So uh, done pretty well in the sales stuff. And so after that, um, I, I retired here about a year and a half ago. And my family, and uh, you've had uh, my daughter on this program, Rachel Krause, and she, uh, along with some other members of my family, started a, um, well, she didn't, her, her cousin started this uh, Hopi Relief. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. We started that during the uh, COVID times when the, the reservation was shut down and and they were having an especially hard time getting food and other, you know, uh, sanitation supplies and other things you needed for daily life out to Hopi. Hopi only has like three stores out there and they're like convenience stores. You know, they have a very limited supply of stuff. And so when when these shutdowns came, it was especially hard for them. Uh, not only that, but if you know Hopi where they're at, they're actually inside the boundaries of the Navajo reservation. And Navajo was like the worst hit of anybody in the whole country. So they had extreme, you know, uh, uh, regulations on who could come and go and we were inside that so we didn't have a choice of what we could do i mean they were able to get through and stuff and, and so we were able to manage because we were bringing supplies up to get through that and so um that's kind of what i've been doing since uh, we've acquired a warehouse and uh have uh, done some things we've done uh, Toys for Tots along uh, in association with uh, Hopi Law Enforcement and then some some uh, food distribution, uh, healthcare items, just everyday items. We've done um, miscellaneous sort of things, uh, educational things, books for the kids and shoes for people, all, all sorts of things. Whatever we can get donated to us, we we take out there and and do this. So, so that's what I've been doing. I, I sort of run the warehouse. I, I'm known as Uncle Chuck to the <laughs> to the crowd there, to everybody that works there, because I'm usually the only one that's there on a regular basis in doing this. So I, I do that. Um, I serve as a Sunday school teacher uh, to the 14-year-olds uh, in, in Sunday school, which I always enjoy. I love teaching. And um, and, um, you know, taking care of my family and, and being involved. And I have a, a grandson who's playing uh, football at a D2 school in, in North Dakota. And I've had uh, grandkids playing every sport you can think of over the time. And so for us, it, it's great having, you know, retirement because we can go to all their games regardless of what time they are and, and, and be involved in their lives. So that's that's what I'm doing. I, I, I sort of actually kind of divided my life up in my own mind and, and what's going to happen when, you know, you certain age up to missionary and you're learning, preparing for life. And then once you get back, you're, you're in the, in the growing family part of your life, you know, you're, you're teaching them, protecting them and providing for them and doing all those things. And then now I feel like I'm in what I call the legacy part of my life, where I'm going to try and do those things that will leave some uh, mark for my family on what I've done and the things that I know and the things that uh, I've been taught so that they understand. And, and I don't know that we do enough of that uh, oral family history and face-to-face and -face teaching with family because, uh, you know, Hopi for a long time, they never had a, a written language. And, and, and it's like a lot of languages, uh, especially native languages, they finally create a written language, but nobody can read it because nobody ever grew up with that information. So so there's a written language and, and they're trying to integrate that. But 
uh, I just want them to know about their heritage and their families and the things that, that my parents did. You know, my parents were part of the group of, of natives that were um, shipped off to uh, boarding schools. And I remember my dad talking about that. You know, he, literally the army came, you know, he tried to hide and his mom tried to hide him and uh, they came and got him and put him on the big truck and they took him over to this place uh, in uh, Western Arizona near um, Kingman, Arizona. It's called uh, Truxton Cannon uh, at Valentine. The school was at Valentine, this little town. And in the later years of my, of my dad's life, uh, him and I took a trip just him me and him and, and we rode out to that place and rode around the school because the old building is still there, the main building and and we drove all over the place all over the hills back there and he told me all the stories and, and it's interesting that he has no i mean i'm sure he has bad memories i know he escaped from the school one time and jumped the train hopped the train out of town and and got got away they found him and brought him back but um it's not a um a thing where he, he has a lot of animosity toward this. He all we I got out of it was it was an adventure for him, him and his friends. I mean, they explored and they pulled pranks and they they did stuff and got in trouble and laughed about it. And and my mom was the same way. You know, she she uh, talked about her experience there also. And and there was never any you know they were mean and hateful to us. It's like we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. And, but we would go hide and we would talk Hopi and we'd laugh about the things that they were doing. And, you know, so so they had an experience that that I think maybe is unique. I don't know, but but they certainly didn't complain about that. It was just part of what happened to them growing up. And, and I think I, I take that for myself and realize that there are a lot of times when, when we panic about stuff, we are, think we're so oppressed or, or in such bad shape or things are not going right for us. I, I, I recently had a, uh, a bout with uh, colon cancer. And uh, when it was first uh, diagnosed, everybody's, oh, what's this? What's I said, you know what? I don't know anything yet. They got to take the biopsy and they got to check it out and they got to run some tests and stuff. And then I'll get to talk to the doctors. But I said, right now, I'm not going to worry about it because right now I don't know anything. <laughs> and so I'm just fine with that. You know, once once they do all this, and, and I think it's, it was that kind of the mentality for them that that brushed off on me. You know, if, if we're going somewhere and and we're, you know, 20 miles away and it starts in 10 minutes, you know, uh, people are panicking. Oh, we're not going to get there. We're going to be late. I said, no, we got we got 10 minutes. You know, we're not late. <laughs> we got 10 more minutes. I said, in 10 minutes, we'll be late. But right now we're <laughs> fine. You know, so right now we're good. And so I think. Uh, all that uh, has has made me uh, a better member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All, all those things help temper me in my understanding of the church. And, and now in this part of my life, I want to teach that to my kids and to my grandkids that, you know, don't don't think that everything's over. I mean, the great thing about being a member of the church is we already know who won. We already know who wins this thing. Uh, I don't know why we worry about so many of these other things. Is because I know that our Heavenly Father and our Savior will prevail. We know it. And, and so why worry about that stuff? We, our job is to take care of each other right here. The, the next person over or the phone call or the, the uh, message to somebody or bringing food to people who need it. Um, those are the things that are really important. The other stuff is just worry because we're not gonna do anything about it. Hopefully we can help, but we already know what the outcome is. Let's, let's relax. I think that's brilliant. I think that's so good because it's resiliency <clears throat> and it's hope and faith and it's, looking for joy it's i i think all those things that you just said are things that will bring us peace in this life yeah i have one final question for you what does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of israel you know i, I thought about that a little bit and, and i think to me it's it's 
the responsibility. Ho Hopi have this thing that they believe that they are the stewards of all things, not only just this earth, but they're stewards of the universe. That that if they don't do their ceremonies, they don't do the things that they they're supposed to do, that things will get out of whack, that things will get confused and 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 uh, there'll be problems and and disease and issues and just they they live the way they do because they feel it's a responsibility they are stewards they were given these things at the beginning and said do this and everything will continue fine you will have challenges and problems but everything else will, will just move along like it should and, and that's kind of how it is with me in in being a, a member of the house of israel and having that covenant and those blessings around you it's it's Great, and I understand that that there's uh, blessings available to me in that. But to me, it's more of a challenge and a responsibility. It's it's a reminder to me of who I am and what things I need to do to do my part here in making sure this gospel goes forward and that my family is a forever family. And that I have an opportunity to bring others uh, into the gospel and make their lives better. And um, I, I was, we were talking about this uh, not too long ago, our elders quorum. And one of the things that they were talking about was what is it that keeps you strong in your testimony? What keeps you close to the church? And, and I thought about that, and, and one of the scriptures that came to mind was the uh, stories about the anti-Nephite Lehi's and how they laid down their arms and were willing to do, even die, so that they didn't break their covenant. You read in that scripture, and it says, well, this is just the last part of uh, Alma 23, verse 6. It says, the power of God working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many of the Lamanites has believed in their preaching and were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. And I, I think about that. That's what I want. I want to be one of those persons who never falls away, that always has that strength. And, and understanding this and the stewardship that I have the responsibilities of the priesthood and uh, the promises helps me. That that I, is something I can think about every day. You know, sometimes all the the uh, ancient ordinances and covenants maybe aren't aren't on the forefront of our minds. I, I think you know that's why in ancient days they had those phylacteries. You know, those little things they'd hang in their forehead or their arm and with scriptures and stuff in there to remind them. Otherwise, they'd forget about some of these things. But 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 that being burned into my mind that uh, that if I never want to fall away, these are the things that I need to do. I need to believe in that preaching, and I need to put some work into that, and to uh, succor my fellow man. And especially at this time, as I, we're trying to do with this nonprofit, is to do that for our people. They're they're so isolated, you know. Um, they're, they're, it's not easy for, let's say, somebody who's who's compromised about food. They, they don't have money to buy food or there's no food in the, available. And uh, if they aren't financially able to, you know, people think, well, you just go to a, 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 a food bank or something. Well, for them, that's 60, 70 miles away. And if you don't have money for food, you probably don't have money for gas for your car or whatever. So uh, that's one of our aims is to try and build a, a food bank up there to provide for the people there and, and do what we can. You know, I, I have such a testimony of this gospel. I know, I know it's true. Um, I, I have faith, but more than that, I, I want to believe and I understand that these teachings are so valuable and, and it's it's hard sometimes 
we get scared to tell other people about it. I don't know why. I mean, we get excited and we go to a movie and see a movie and we tell everybody. We go to a new restaurant. We tell them all about that. But we uh, balk at the idea of telling them about an opportunity for their families to be together forever and to have joy and happiness in that. And we're afraid to do that because we're afraid they'll be mad at us, that they won't like us, that we're somehow interfering with them. I mean, this is this is what uh, Alma and and his cohorts were so worried about that people would not have the gospel, that they they were willing to go into the the mouth of the lion, you know, to go into the people that hated them to bring them the gospel because it was so important that they didn't experience what they experienced when the angel came to them and showed them what it could be. Um, that it, they gave their whole lives to do that. So I'm grateful for this knowledge. I'm grateful for this testimony. And I'm grateful to you for doing this, for spreading these words and, and telling other people about um, experiences that are out there and that everyone can have these experiences. Everyone can um, enjoy these blessings. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kay. I have been fed and um, I've been lifted today. Thank you. So this past Sunday was Christmas Day. And my kids were kind enough to let us sleep in until about 6 o'clock. So I'm glad about that. But I don't know if I've ever paid attention to a Christmas Sunday before. I was so grateful to be able to go to church on Sunday morning with my family and with the congregation that I love, friends that I just have grown to love so much, and worship together our Savior Jesus Christ. I love singing in the ward choir. I love that there are people with a, uh, special musical abilities that could share that. My little Quentin played the flute. He did an angel's melody. It was angels from the realms of glory and uh, angels we have heard on high. And he just did that so well. But it was so nice to be there. Um, our stake patriarch is in our ward and he read the uh, Luke chapter 2 to the congregation. And we had other other scriptures that we that were read and so and then the bishop just spoke for just a few minutes it was just an amazing wonderful worship service and I just want to say again how grateful that I am that our savior came here and that he was born of Mary and was raised by Mary and Joseph and that he did all that he was asked to do. I am so grateful for him, for our Savior. And I say that in his name, Jesus Christ, amen. And I hope that your Christmas day was wonderful and beautiful and that you were able to go to church and worship with your congregation and that you could feel the Spirit. And I say that and hope you have a super wonderful, awesome day. Tribe of Testimonies is not sponsored by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. I would love to hear from you. I would love to hear how this podcast is affecting you. And I'm always looking for guests. If you or someone you know would be a great guest, you can reach me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com. <laughs>